today of course are doing a session whose subject is slightly um, alien to me also so because we'll be learning all of us will be learning a lot of new things we were a little skeptical kumar and i about preparing for this subject because a lot of this is related to indoor management and therefore the family physician may not be uh, i didn't be able to identify with the subject but uh, the desire was that there are so many things that we should know to be able to guide our patients appropriately so uh, i have i have requested all the speakers today because these are they are uh, super specialists and of course they don't uh, uh, they don't hold back their discussions uh, of of their expertise i have requested them that they come down to our level and explain things to us which are relevant to us because there are many things which are kind of difficult for us to understand and probably not necessary also so uh, constantly that will be i will be pulling them back whenever necessary so that <laughs> so that they they, they stay with us uh, because kafi cheeze aisi hain jo can go uh, slightly above our head uh, our first speaker dr nishant aditya uh, is a uh, trained radiologist and thereafter he trained himself in neuro uh, intervention neuro radiology uh, born in bihar educated mbbs md in ahmedabad then uh, super specialty of neuro radiology in km hospital where he spent 3 years and now after he said i i asked him where does he practice he said i had spread myself thin from central suburbs to western suburbs north and south bombay but now uh, he concentrates in south mumbai where uh, he practices at uh, hn reliance hospital saifi Bom bombay hospital sir no hn reliance and bridge candy saifi dr arun shah reddy neurologist who has been with us before he strongly recommended dr nishant to uh, to me because i did not know him before this and i'm extremely glad uh, that he is here um, so dr nishant without further ado we can um, yeah you take this mic so uh, thank you for kind words and uh, since last two months uh, i'm meeting all of you in physical form and i see uh, so many familiar faces uh, even from so many uh, mahalakshmi south bombay cmes uh, uh, as a super specialty i take all the glory for you know stroke intervention when patient recovers you know but ultimate story starts with all of you when you get a call that somebody is having facial weakness speech and despite having a late night yesterday still uh, i wanted to be here just just to communicate and what is the most important uh, thing in stroke as we have discussed that this will be a, like a direct interaction uh, just one message if we want to carry from this meet to our practice are on the side of wrong investigation what we are going to lose suppose you get a patient who is having a stroke mimic severe giddiness right and we got mri angiography and mri done and it turns out to be negative normal what we lost maximum best of the best center 10000 rupees imagine if it is a pre dromal sign of a bacillus stroke you have saved a life because if you have seen a posterior circulation stroke patient neither they are dead nor they are alive they are just vegetable <coughs> they are breathing they are opening eyes there is no registration and a huge burden although burden is always having a negative connotation but ultimate when you go to ground zero when you see the family in in situ you can see the burden of stroke actually you know the first 7 day 10 days are okay but after that is a huge huge implication so are on the side of investigation wrong investigation nothing we are going to lose yeah Uh, so uh, two areas that we are going to discuss today principally are uh, neuro intervention in ischemic strokes and neuro intervention in subarachnoid hemorrhage these are two areas to be quickly identified by the family physician 
and therefore quickly referred to the uh, so the, my first question to him is if they have a hemiplegia in their clinic yes. or in the at home and um, they have to act immediately the hours i have been say 3 hours what is the first step that they should do so thoda sa we'll move that side for the sake of the video okay we'll move a little on the right all right so that uh, okay i'm a little broad wide <coughs> so 50% uh, patient will call you they may not be in your clinic because uh, so many of us must be for the generation together with the family so whenever somebody says that he is not able to move his face or arm or not able to speak immediately you must be having a center imaging center now ct scan and mri is available everywhere get a immediate ct scan done what it it will do for your practical purpose it will exclude the hemorrhage to ischemia first thing because if there is a hemorrhage and what is a practice as soon as you hear a stroke you give eco spray natural like uh, for a sublingual solvitrate the same thing is coming to stroke also which may not be that dangerous but it may be dangerous for a hemorrhagic stroke so first thing first a local ct scan should be done before coming to your clinic get a ct scan done on the way and by the time either you reach or somebody should communicate from the center that this is hemorrhage or uh, ischemic stroke that's number one there if mri facility is there if there is no hemorrhage go for mr and mr angiography you set a stroke protocol and there are very few sequences you can write it down diffusion weighted defect diffusion weighted sequence that's number 1 in mri number 2 is flare and third is sw that is susceptibility weighted sequence that exclude even minor hemorrhages and one mr angiography neck and circular villus that's it we don't have to go all those 20 sequence of mri no need to get perfusion unless we are dealing a very specific category of the stroke then and then we do uh, perfusion studies nowadays yeah so diffusion dw uh just we'll keep on explaining them what does diffusion yeah. show or what what is it meant for correct so first we'll go to the sequences dw flare flare f l a i r s w susceptibility weighted and mr angiography circular villus and neck yeah so majority of us know ct scan how hemorrhage look white right how stroke ischemic stroke looks black because ct scan you have seen multiple time mri is little new for all of us so on mri you can see the diffusion defect like white you can we can go to one image sure so just go go forward go forward go 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 yes so uh, lady 86 year young so you can see here Uh, Kumar, can background? you just ask them to reduce the lights in the front? Yeah, this. Can you see little white veil? Very early changes of stroke on diffusion looks like this. She came within two two hours of stroke. This is very rare, but now because of awareness, we are getting patient in this window period. And this white, the brightness of this white, goes toward the brighter side when we progress in the timeline. so after 3 hours it will be brighter than this so this you can pick easily even by yourself diffusion weighted sequence white part is the stroke this is how it looks yeah uh, before he goes ahead for the family physician very important now that because of covid we have gotten used to video consultations on whatsapp video i request you whenever a patient calls you on the phone saying that my mother cannot speak properly or cannot walk or etc do not continue the conversation on audio calls switch to video immediately Correct. and on video call look at the patient it is extremely easy for you to suspect a stroke and therefore refer a patient i just have a question to you if they have to immediately send for a ct scan or an mri is it better not to send to a local center diagnostic center 
uh, and instead sent to a tertiary health center, tertiary neurology center, where stroke unit is there. Then you will save that time because here, if you are talking about CT followed by MRI, yeah. you are wasting maybe one hour plus. Correct. Yeah. So uh, what I meant is, uh, is the best. This is the holy grail that. Uh, stroke should be treated in a tertiary care center. And we are having many in Mumbai. We are fortunate enough to have at least in 10 kilometer uh, direction in either side of your clinic, we are having a tertiary care center. That is the best to do it because I'm telling you, not many hospital being a tertiary care center are sensitized for the stroke. You know, if you go to a hospital, you try to get patient admitted, you yourself will take one hour. So we have to reach to a hospital which is stroke sensitized, means their stroke we are doing day in and day out. So that's the best thing for a stroke treatment. I'm talking ischemic stroke, where time is the most important factor, you know. Despite doing everything, we can't reverse the clock. So that's the best, best to do it. Get your acquaintance with a good tertiary care center where you are having the ER number, you are having a neurophysician's number and one of us number. Another thing that on the telephone that I think we should all do is ask the relatives to test the sugar because hypoglycemia can be, as he said, a stroke mimic. At least that you should do immediately. Yeah. And the patient will often tell you, Lekin hum, can we give the patient something? The relative will ask you, Humko kuch to, dene do to the patient before we take him to the hospital. I believe that since uh, uh, intervention has become important, we will need to ask him whether giving dispirin is a desirable thing at home, undesirable because of a possibility of hemorrhage or if you are doing some procedure where dispirin may not be required. Should we dissuade them from taking anything? Also, aspiration is a problem if the patient is drowsy. Correct. So, should you give something to the patient at all? Yeah. So, two very basic things. Uh, like you must have uh, uh, gone to road traffic accident seminars. Keep patient upright because many of the patient will be very drowsy. Don't give anything orally, not even uh, equosprin or any medication, okay? One, just uh, this uh, hemorrhagic and ischemic conundrum, and second, he may aspirate, okay? So try to tell the relative, keep him upright. Even they're bringing him in taxi to a hospital, keep him up. Don't allow him to lie down. I don't give anything orally, yeah? Even giving as equosprin in a large vessel stroke is not going to make any difference. So just don't give anything. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we are dealing with a very large stroke if, if somebody is hemiplegic. So there the benefit and risk ratio of keeping up versus hypotension is very uh, good towards the benefit of keeping him up, avoiding the aspiration rather than hypotension. You must have seen all stroke patient will have their uh, blood pressure through the roof. You must have seen 200 because that is the body, body mechanism. Heart got the signal that head office is not working. So he's trying to push that blood through the uh, clot. So I think uh, also that is another important point. The patient's relative will often measure the BP and say the BP is 170 by 100. Should I give a BP medicine? Yeah. So don't what drop, they do? Yeah. Don't, don't drop the blood pressure because that is, that is how whatever collateral is there, it is getting preserved. Don't drop it. No, don't give dysprin. No, the no point discipline. is not to give aspirin at all. Uh, so once the patient reaches the tertiary center, what happens to the patient? Yeah. So as... Yeah. Sugar, sugar is low. Yeah. If sugar is low... Yeah. So then it comes to the stroke mimic. So just exclude that there is no focal weakness. So you, you must have seen the hypoglycemia will have a generalized decrease in consciousness. It never have a focal deficit. Get my point? Somebody will be, have a blackout after hypoglycemia. They won't have focal deficit, like arm is not moving. If arm is not moving or anything, same thing. Means don't give anything orally. If he's drowsy or moving all four limbs, little knocked out, then give sugar, all the situation of hypoglycemic treatment. But if you're having a focal deficit, means he's not able to speak or not able to move the one arm, then don't give anything orally. Generally, hypoglycemia with drowsiness has to go to the hospital. Yeah. Don't ask the patient to give sugar at home. Correct. And take intravenous uh, uh, glycogen or uh, glucagon or intravenous sugar. And if the patient fully recovers, 
now that you have completed the criteria for hypoglycemia as a mimic, uh, what is that called? Triad? Whipple's? What would you call it? Whipple's triad. Whipple's triad is hypo, uh, symptoms of hypoglycemia, documentation of hypoglycemia, correction of uh, sensorium with sugar. Once the three criteria have been satisfied, then you can be sure that we may not even need to do a CT scan. So as soon as uh, um, IV thrombolysis will be started, we drop the blood pressure in in a hospital, not on the way. So keep it like that, bring to a hospital. Because if we have to do uh, the IV thrombolysis, we drop it to 160, 170. There also we don't go to 120. And after thrombectomy, we drop to 120. So what he's saying is, uh, do not meddle with BP, only yeah. meddle with sugar at home yeah. or in the hospital. and. Uh, as he said, when they reach the hospital, they need to keep the BP below 180, 110 yeah. for thrombolysis. Yes. Otherwise, thrombolysis causes hemorrhage. So that they will do with intravenous labetalol or any such uh, intravenous drip. Yeah. So as uh, uh, about the previous question, uh, earlier we used to say this hospital is stroke ready hospital. Means you have to have a neurologist, neurosurgeon, intervention, a neuroradiologist and CT and MRI. These are the five criteria world over for the stroke ready hospital. We are one step ahead, stroke sensitive hospital. When a patient comes, whether in taxi or ambulance, the sensitization should start from the door man to the cath lab suite. It, it shouldn't happen that patient going for an estimate and taking 45 minutes there. No, estimate contrast should come to the stroke unit. Okay, so this sensitization happens over time. It, won't happen overnight. Even for you, if you send a patient to a tertiary care center, their feedback is terrible. No, Nobody is updating you and relatives are bombarding you with a call after every half an hour and you, do, you don't have any clue that what's going on there. So these things we made in all these five, six, six hospitals in Mumbai, that they should update the concerned physician also from their side. You know, we are having a stroke counselor in the hospital. So stroke sensitive hospital is very important. Because if you see, you, if you are doing a procedure, it's natural that account will come into the picture. The monetary part will come to picture. But we shouldn't lose the precious time into all those things and losing our goal. So a stroke sensitive hospital, you have to make that logistics for your own practice. And that we have to figure it out. Uh, we, we stopped at one point here where we discussed MRI. First, uh, first sequence, but uh, that's I, I skipped because I wanted to go to what happens in the hospital, including imaging, CT, and MRI. So a patient has come with a left hemiparesis and uh, is in the stroke uh, unit. First, you will do a CT, or you might go for an MRI straight away. First CT scan. We are having CT as majority of hospital near the ER. So first, do CT. Okay. If patient is well within the window period of three and a half hours IVTP, we start TP half dose. I'll repeat that. Uh, you, uh, there is a window of stroke. Suppose yeah. the onset of stroke to the patient's arrival at the hospital is less than, is it four and a half or three and a half? Three and a half now. It's now three and a half. half. It's less than three and a half. The patient fits into the criterion for giving intravenous thrombolytic therapy in the form of uh, TPA or tenecteplase. Uh, patient can be given this and may not need a further intervention in the form of thrombectomy, thrombosuction or thrombectomy. Is that right? Yes. So, yeah, you, you were saying. So, exclude the hemorrhage. Like, the same thing. Uh, we talked, first exclude the hemorrhage. Then we are in the ischemic area. Within the window period of IV thrombolysis, three and a half hours, start small dose, half dose of IV TPA. Go for MRI. Half dose of TPA. Recombinant... Uh, uh, tissue plasminogen and once this diffusion is done go to next slide go just play yeah this is MR angiography these MR angiography is done without contrast these are very uh, majority of our MRI center having three Tesla machine now and there we diagnose this kind of blockages okay if this this kind of thrombus load is seen we don't finish the TPA. We don't wait for TPA to get finished and having its effect. We directly go for thrombectomy.
okay so, so i will you can show the area of so the artery name and so the you remember the diffusion weighted defect was on this side left side right the white white veil on the left hemisphere so this is middle cerebral artery it goes there like this is the normal middle cerebral artery on the right side if you compare this with this it goes and stops in sylvian fissure go next pardon this is mr angiography mr angiography which we talked about two circle of willis this is circle of willis mr angiography yeah mr angiography if clot burden the thrombus burden is large because middle cerebral artery is a 3 mm artery is a large artery we don't wait for iv tpa to take its effect or finish the dose we directly go to the angio suite if this method is called drip and ship you start the drip and ship to the cath lab okay and this is how it looks on uh, angiography so this is middle cerebral artery this is anterior cerebral artery this is carotid artery and there is the petrous segment of carotid artery so it goes there and stops there is nothing here it's completely blank this is corporate pardon this is no this is dsa digital subtraction angiography because why it is called digital subtraction angiography because you can't see the skull here right brain is encased in the skull so digitally the software removes the skull remove the bone and what we see is just the blood vessel so we reached here now go to next slide next slide so these are few of the devices we use is like a dormia basket old dormia basket next 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 so there we come to our case situation next and this is the thrombus look at the size of the thrombus how we came to this stage in thrombectomy we knew that tenecte place or uh, tissue plasminogen is not going to act when the thrombus is encased with fibrin which is matured one so in old days when tpa started 1996 till 2003 to 4 tpa success rate still is less than 20% but at that time 20% was a huge success rate that's how we come to know that these kind of thrombi are not going to get dissolved by tpa by any intravenous medication and look at the uh, thrombus you know this is the area where i caught it and this is the corpus next and this is the result you get you see this this is pre and post you know you see the full middle cerebral artery is uh, recanalized 10 years ago for 86 year old if you read the old criteria of iv thrombolysis 80 plus is a contraindication and now we do regularly 80 plus and this is going to be much more because all of us almost majority of us will we are going to be in our 80s hell and hearty so these are the situation going to be many more time the devices are getting better so all those atherosclerotic part is out of the window if you are having very good expertise and uh, uh, logistics 80 years a regulation of uh, treatment nowadays for stroke and next and this is magical this is pure magic once you take the thrombus out speech started recovering the first and the gauge paresis you know that we are having a stereoscopic gauge no after baboons only got we got a stereoscopy means when i look at you i look at both eyes in your eyes this vision get hampered first in acute stroke and that is the first thing you see the patient started looking in the mid line and you know the dictum patient looks on the side of occlusion so for the left hemispheric stroke patient will keep looking on the left side they, they can't look on the right side so as soon as you remove the thrombus their gaze comes to the normal and next and she recovered virtually by norm morning and discharge on day 6 so yeah so this is this is what i was walking through a, when a patient comes in a window period and when she goes to home and we do few investigation like trans esophageal echocardiography and halters just to see the paroxysmal uh, atrial fibrillation and that's about it this is so, now more than 5 years now no for the episodes so about the timing uh, he told you that 3 and 1/2 hours is the window for thrombolytic therapy 
thrombolytic therapy is one form of therapy the other form of therapy he discussed was thrombectomy removing the thrombus physically removing the thrombus what is the window for that yeah so, yeah so uh, when we started in 2014 uh, when the all trials five trials came our window period was till 8 hours yeah the best best of the best result at that time also we were venturing beyond the 6 hours by documenting the penumbra so what is penumbra uh penumbra is like the literal term is penumbra is when the sun is having this its corona and there we call it penumbra means there is a side with a circle uh, beyond the center and umbra is the center the core so when this straight jacketed timeline came for three and a half to four and a half for iv thrombolysis and six hours of thrombectomy or intraarterial thrombolysis we were seeing some of the patient fluctuating stuttering stroke so that's how this trial came down and uh, a diffuse trial and then we started doing thrombectomy consistently beyond 6 hours beyond 8 hours and by now we are doing consistently next day second day thrombectomy so what is the inclusion criteria so if you see a patient having right side weakness zero par and you get a diffusion imaging done and there is a very diffusion small diffusion weighted defects so it's not matching so this is called clinical radiological mismatch you are having a small diffusion that means brain has suffered a small damage but still patient is having huge deficit so how we define the deficit as we were discussing so there is a scale will get printed all of us will get printed and put in our clinic is called nihs score n i h s s so what are the basic four things it's called fast face arm speech and time means if you ask patient what the time they won't have any orientation so this four thing fast if is filling all four criteria we are dealing with a major stroke otherwise definition of major stroke anything more than 8 to 10 n i h s s is major stroke so again clinical radiological mismatch suggests there is a penumbra means whole tissue is not infected there is still salvageable tissue so suppose a patient coming to you on third day of stroke and still his weakness is not improving you get a mri angiography done and if availability is there get a perfusion study done and then ask them what is the core and what is penumbra so if you if you tell the radiologist local mri radiologist they will give you the data they take little time because they are not doing regularly but they will be able to tell you that there is a penumbra and in those cases we should try to intervene we should try to find the reason why there is a penumbra and why patient is not infarcting completely and can we help them to improve from the stage they are in to a full recovery i'll just repeat some things here because this is very important for us uh, umbra umbra is the space where infarction has occurred which will not recover penumbra is the space around the umbra where there is uh, like we have myocardium at jeopardy we have uh, brain at jeopardy and that brain at jeopardy is salvageable if uh, if uh, you remove the thrombus penumbra how do we determine the extent of the penumbra is what he uh, uh, taught us there are two ways to determine the extent of the penumbra one is a clinical radiologic mismatch meaning the patient's paresis is far more than the mri shows that tells you that there is a mismatch and therefore we have to probably go in and the second way to know that there is a big penumbra is by doing what is called a perfusion study in the mri in in the diffusion study we know the infarcted area in the perfusion study we know the area at jeopardy so this is am i making mistakes yeah. no. no so this is how we will be able to know what the penumbra is like and therefore they will know whether to go in or not correct sir fast criteria instead of time they are writing thumb also correct so tang is phase the sub sub like the posterior circulation stroke you won't have a phasia they, you have dysarthria so in that case the delivery of speech is wrong is not the speech while in tracheal circulation stroke the center is 
gone down. Prakash and vernix is affected. So your tongue movement, suppose somebody is saying, I'm having slurring of speech. So that can be because of two reasons, right? One is the face weakness, which is the entire circulation stroke. And one is the tongue, which is the posterior circulation territory. So that's why tongue is added. OK. Thrombus. Size of thrombus. Suppose uh, this patient, we started shipping because she came two and a half hours. Although she's 86, we can't give full dose. We know that. So start with a small dose, like one third of dose. Document the MRI. What is the size of the thrombus? Suppose she's having a small clot in the sylvan fissure branch of middle sublarty. No need for go for thrombectomy. IV thrombolysis will take care. Yeah. In her case, only difference was little age. So IV thrombolysis may create a higher conversion rate of hemorrhage. What is the... Yeah. Yeah, means suppose it's not middle sublarty, it's the distal branch. So branch occlusion, we still go with thrombolysis, full dose. What are the chances of going to the hemorrhagic Yeah. What is the incidence of hemorrhagic stroke? So as uh, we were discussing umbra and penumbra, if somebody is coming with a large stroke, so many unfortunate individuals, uh, they're not patients, they're individuals. You know, two hours ago they were healthy. Those patients are fast progressor and they have to start with a large stroke, with a large deficit, means radiological, clinical matching. You know, these are the patients, they hemorrhage maximum, whether you give IVTP or whether do the thrombectomy. So, but over the period um, we learned as a community world over that the most important thing to control the blood pressure. So in all these cases, we drop the blood pressure, as you were asking, drop the blood pressure to less than 120, because I have opened the tube. So blood flow is not a problem. So those cases, we drop the blood pressure. Despite that, we are still having 20 to 25 percent of major hemorrhage in all this situation. So hemorrhage is more after IV thrombolysis successful or after thrombectomy successful? IV thrombolysis because it's in the whole circulation. Correct. So you can't control. Okay. Uh, in in. Quran Pardon. In the small hemorrhage, mortality is less than 10%, but major hemorrhage, mortality is still more than 20%. One-fifth major hemorrhages, hemispheric. In uh, coronary artery disease, when your patient gets a myocardial infarction and there's thrombus, they'll do a thrombosuction and they'll immediately put in, put a stent. They'll do an angioplasty and put a stent. In neurology, that is not the case. When do you stent the culprit artery? Correct. So go next to our evolution. Go, 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 go fast. Go fast. Go, 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 go. Yeah, go back. So whenever, uh, whenever we talk about the brain circulation, uh, we have to think from where we came, right? That like, uh, Roosevelt said, if you don't know your past, you can't chart out your future. So this is how we came. We, we claim that we are the you know, king of this planet. We are holding the planet. Our whole history, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, is at the tip of nail. If you consider this hand as a whole evolutionary um, history of our planet, of living organism, we are the tip of our nail of our middle finger. One file of the nail, we are done. And this is what we're going to be soon. And this has happened over the period of time. Um, first organism came onto this earth 3,000 million years ago. Our whole history is 7,000 million years ago. So next. And this is how we started with monocellular organism. Next. Go back. Yeah, just play. No? Yeah, just. Okay. So, uh, it just uh, from unicellular to went to back to um, multicellular, you know, the problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
So we started the menu seller, then layers came, then fungi, algae, amoeba, then celentrates with cavity. And real job started when we got the jaw in the fish, and then we came out, dinosaurs, and we came out of the tree. Next. Next, yeah, yeah. In all this uh, 230, 250 million years of time period from the time we got a lower jaw, it was a major event in evolution. From till here, the whole system, brain stem, cerebellum, midbrain, and the whole pons and medullary system are same. If you see, only difference is this telencephalon. Telencephalon is a very new structure for our brain. A new structure means uh, 30 to 40 million years of time period. For a paleontological clock, 30 million years is nothing, it's like a blink. So over 30, 40 million years, we got this telencephalon, our whole, that's how we got upright, we start painting, poetry, all this movies business, because of the telencephalon. But it's a pure nuisance value, there's no value of telencephalon per se for survival. You know, the ants and cockroaches, they don't have telencephalon. They are living for 200, 300 million years without any uh, uh, protection problem. And we can't fight by barehanded dog. So this kind of telencephalon, pure nuisance value. However, this is a, like a gas guzzler. You know that 20% of our glucose demand is consumed by this nuisance value. What it did to our circulation that it is so sensitive that even the minor changes, it creates a havoc. Because it's a new structure, it's, it's not meant to do this kind of work. Our whole idea was on this planet to live in the tree, run away from the tigers, and that's it. We were not supposed to create this building or paint. So this is so sensitive that even the minor things, it, it gets wrong because the demand is so high. Next. Or you can go back a little bit. Yeah. Next, yes. So intracranial circulation is very different than the rest of the heart circulation. Why I'm telling you? Because always analogy, analogy is from the cardiac experience, right? How we came into neurointervention? Because of the cardiac. We saw that somebody is putting there. But we came to know that it is two different structure because the heart was there, even in the fish, lemurs, chimpanzees, and to us also. So Heart is a very mature structure, like kidney, liver. You haven't seen, uh, you haven't heard the uh, kidney stroke, somebody has a kidney stroke, never, because it's a very evolved structure. It won't have, even the few vessels are blocked, they won't have stroke, or liver, they won't have stroke. It's not because it's a, a different organ, it's the same organ, but it's much more evolved. So, if you know that, there is no diastolic notch in the brain circulation, because brain, again, is a gas guzzler. It demands so much of energy, so nature has evolved in such a way for us that there shouldn't be a diastolic notch. So brain is having continuous blood supply. That's number one. Number two, same thing. Because of our very short duration on this planet of 30, 40 million years, we don't have wall in the blood vessels. So whatever we do is extremely fine. And number three is the autoregulation as we were talking about the hemorrhage. Why hemorrhage happens? Why the blood pressure is so high during the stroke? Because body is auto-regulating. There is a thrombus, there is a clot, blood is not reaching. So it feed, feed back the heart and the auto-regulation. In carotid artery disease and the stroke, that auto-regulation goes for a toss. And that's how hemorrhage happens because body is not able to manage that. Now the artery is open. You have to control the blood pressure. So we have to come to the picture and stop it. So we drop the blood pressure. Next, I will show you the character stenting, just how we do it. So once acute phase is over, patient went home, we don't stent in the emergency situation unless artery is coiling back to the occlusion. So like this situation, we send patient back after thrombectomy and call them after six weeks. So why six weeks? Because six weeks is the period where endothelialization repeats itself, 42 days. <coughs> so in all this situation, we wait for six weeks, call the patient, 
take a fresh look on the carotid uh, uh, blockages, carotid stenosis. Go next. So, this very important uh, fact here, if you remember, asymptomatic carotid artery disease we used to conserve, remember? Now there is a change after we started doing thrombectomy. All across the globe, 30 to 40 percent of stroke, we are having tandem occlusion, means one occlusion in the neck and one in the brain. So this stenosis has gathered the clot and thrown into the brain. So world over we started gathering data and we came to a conclusion that more than 70-75% stenosis, even it is asymptomatic or one episode should go for stenting. One episode to 100% we are doing for any kind of uh, atherosclerotic disease because now the plaque is very important. Why I am telling you this? Because if you see this, the stenosis is not more than 70%, less than 60% and go pr prior. Here it is more than 90%, here there is no uh, discussion or the, because it's a hemodynamic. Blood is not going to pass through that area, so that's why they're getting the recurrent stroke. Next. While this stroke is completely different song, here the plaque is unstable. It gathers the platelet, forms small thrombi and embolizing it. Both, if patients are symptomatic, there is no confusion. However, in these cases, if patient is asymptomatic, get a good statin and single antiplatelet. Should be more than enough. Given that there is no TIA history, you got it done, a Doppler, regular Doppler, the health checkup, and you got this. However, prior case, even it is asymptomatic, more than 75%, we should treat it in expert hand, of course, because always we have to balance the risk versus benefit ratio. And what is the risk? What is the one nightmare for the character stenting is the loss of heart regulation and hemorrhage. Yeah. And on table stroke, but on table stroke is pretty low now because we started using the distal protection device. On table stroke is very low. What is the dreaded nightmarish thing in an asymptomatic patient is the hemorrhage. And in all those cases, we need a very good setup to control the blood pressure to the core. So as soon as you stand, you drop the blood pressure to 120, 130. You must have seen few patients. Despite three hypertensive medicine, still the blood pressure is not budging down. Why? because body is trying to push the blood through the asymptomatic stenosis. Okay? So whenever you see that blood pressure is not getting managed, get a Doppler done. I'll just repeat uh, so that we are clear about carotid artery stenting. There are two situations that he has described. One is after an actual stroke where a thrombectomy was done or a thrombolysis was done. After that, even if there is a narrowing in the internal carotid artery, for example, you will not stent the artery for at least six weeks. In cardiology, we stent immediately. Not stent the artery for six weeks. After six weeks, you repeat maybe a, a CT angio or an MR angio, and you see the stenosis uh, in the carotid, and then you do an elective uh, angioplasty and stenting, even if, even if the narrowing is not 70%. Correct. Correct? Yeah. Even if, so is there a limit, 30%, 40%? So or you just see a plaque and you... Correct. So in all this situation, if it is less than 60% and the plaque is smooth, we don't stent. We know that there is no instability. This is a post-thrombectomy situation. Post-thrombectomy I'm talking about. On the table and post, when we do the repeat uh, mm -hmm. color Doppler or a um, MR angiography, if plaque is stable, if there is a smooth layer of the endothelium across the, and less than 60%, despite having the stroke, we know that from there it has gone, we don't stand. If the same thing, with 60%, we are having unstable, hypoechoic, you must have read the hypoechoic plaque, then we stand them. Okay, so that they'll be reporting it as a hazy plaque or a hypoechoic yeah. plaque, and then the, because it is an unstable plaque, which the potential of gathering a thrombus and embolizing, they will say. So that is one situation. Post stroke thrombectomy thrombolysis stenting after six weeks. The second situation is a patient comes to you with a carotid artery stenosis on a Doppler. Maybe the patient is asymptomatic completely, but 
for some reason you heard a brewy you got a doppler done you find a stenosis now do you leave the stenosis alone or you do an angioplasty of that carotid artery prophylactically as a primary prevention and there he is saying is that if it is more than 75% if it is more than 75% even asymptomatic patients stand the artery at a good center in experienced hands yeah. and if it is less than 75% conserve then conserve its statins aspirin yeah. or what have you yes correct correct yeah so uh, six weeks the time when endothelium repeats its cycle so uh, our body regenerates itself in nine months everything means uh, especially the functional organs like liver where the enzymes are getting created by endothelium secretion so endothelial cycle completes in six weeks pardon we, we give dual interpreted only no in in the sense of asymptomatic less than 60 percent carotid artery in an incidental diagnosis there you will give one antiplatelet yeah. so that will bring us to the dual antiplatelet therapy correct uh, post stroke yeah. or post intervention what is the dual antiplatelet yeah. that you give and for what duration correct. this question correct so when, once acute phase is over and we are having a carotid artery disease when there is no carotid artery disease, we don't give uh, till 10th day because we know that i have opened the tube tube is uh, proximal tube is open no antiplatelet in till day after that we will start single antiplatelet that's situation number one. Situation number two, large stroke, thrombectomy done, carotid artery disease, we want to conserve. In that case, after 10th day, we start dual interpreted. 150 mg equisprin and 75 mg clopidab. Situation number three, when I am pushed to the wall and I have to stand in the acute session. So, we load patient on single interpreted on the table. That is 300 325 disprint. Disprint we give because it's a little faster than equisprint. Equisprint is coated, so it takes a little time. So 300 disprint, 325 on the table after thrombectomy, control the blood pressure to prevent all hemorrhagic. And after 24 hours, we add 75 clopidab. In between, you must have heard there is a uh, intravenous uh, antiplatelet agent called. 2B3A inhibitors, glycoprotein GB2B3A inhibitors. We give half dose of GB2B3A inhibitor to keep the stent open because the patient was never on du dual antiplatelet. So we bridge that gap between the opening to the takeover of desprin and clopidab till third day. So we give 24 hours, half dose of GB2B3A. Third situation, cool, absolutely. Patient came with TIA, we load for three days. Or if we have to do immediately, we load then there 300, 300, both clopidab and uh, equisprin. And after that, depending on the type of disease, we give 150, 75 or 150, 150. Very well tolerated dose. Duration. Duration, yeah. For one year, we give dual antiplatelet. After that, single baby aspirin for life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Statin, uh, standard dose, if patient is uh, uh, not that kind of cholesterol uh, phase, then 40 mg at RY is good. Roger was written for the little higher uh, cholesterol prone, with family history or something like that. Rose Gold is very good with 75 equosprin and uh, Roger was written. Uh, so, sorry, you said I'm a little confused about one thing only dual antiplatelet therapy, one year. Uh, is there a situation where you give, is there a recommendation where you give dual antiplatelet only for 21 days post stroke and then go to uh, single antiplatelet? So if there is no, no stent is there. Okay. Dual cause single after, after 10, 15 days, there's no okay. problem. So uh, uh, what, from what I have read at least, if patient has had a stroke which did not require intervention or could not do intervention. Correct. Then dual antiplatelet therapy I, 21 days is the probable recommendation, after which you switch to single antiplatelet therapy. Yes. Yeah. Like the small stroke we talked about. Suppose correct. there is a branch occlusion and uh, not even the full dose of TPA is given. So get the TPA dose is over, that is 48 hours. After they start dual antiplatelet, after 15 days you switch on to 75 baby aspirin. Okay. Uh, 
uh, we switch, uh, go to the next topic, which is very important. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Yeah, yeah. so should. Yeah. Had a stroke. He's asking that the patient has had a stroke, could yeah. not do anything in the yeah. window, in the desired window, yes. but he has a carotid artery narrowing. Correct. So, um, same, wait for f four to six weeks because whatever ha hemorrhage has happened or uh, stroke has happened in that, there will be always little hemorrhage. So, wait for that time, repeat a CT after four weeks, see the healing. And after that, you get a carotid Doppler or CT angiography done to see the circular villus and hair. Suppose circular villus showing the remained occlusion of the middle cerebral artery, then stenting won't help at all because we know that even you open the proximal uh, channel, is not going to help on the top. So no intervention at that time. However, if you see a carotid artery stenosis still filling the middle cerebral artery, then you should go for carotid stenting after six weeks just to prevent hemorrhagic conversion. Devish, uh, just Devish. Correct. So uh, this we'll is, repeat his question. Uh, yeah, this is this is what happening now. When we see a large clot, and we know the hemorrhagic risk is much more than the thrombectomy, we are directly going for thrombectomy now. However, because we, we even, live in even within the three and a half hour period, hundred percent. So that's why ship and drip came. How? Because you 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 can't go in black and white zone, right? You have to have some medical evidence. It's, is a, is a law society. We, we are law abiding citizen. So these are the changing time. And why we start uh, shipping, uh, dripping and shipping? Because what evidence suggests till now is the IV thrombolysis in the window period is helpful. Because it's the old data. Whatever we are proposing is now because we are proposing to a system, right? So we start IV thrombolysis. However, in practice, we come to know that. Only 20% success of recanalization and 25% of hemorrhagic conversion risk in a large stroke. So we started doing primary thrombectomy within two hours of window period also, like this case. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is a glycoprotein inhibitors. They act on the bone marrow and they inhibit the platelet activity. For the faster platelet activity, we give them because patient was never on dual interpreted. Now you have to put a stent. So you have to get the anti platelet activity very fast. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll take some more questions later on. We'll wait. We'll wait. Wait. Uh, we'll discuss the second topic, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Yeah. Just yeah. We'll finish it. Uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, as we Next. have already uh, discussed go. in our in go, our go. group. Go, go, go. Our business, our the family physician, the journalist business is to, of course, suspect it and think about subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, as go, the go, cause go. of the severe Correct. headache. Go. All that. Uh, once you decide that the patient may have subarachnoid hemorrhage, yeah, what is the first step that you no, will take? Forward, forward. Where will you send the forward. patient? To a CT scan center for an imaging, like a CT brain plane, or will you send it to a stroke unit straight away? Is is important for us because subarachnoid hemorrhage again is a time sensitive uh, situation. Correct. So what should the, we have had a severe headache, yeah. suspected subarachnoid by the family physician. Correct. Patient has vomiting, patient has some altered sensorium, maybe some focal deficit. And should the patient be sent to a local diagnostic center or straight away to the neuro? Yeah. So um, we discussed earlier for the stroke also, Holy Grail is again a tertiary care center the best of the best. However, if somebody is living a little far, on the way, get a CT scan done. Subarachnoid hemorrhage you can't miss. It's the worst headache. You, even you have witnessed, patient is suffering, as at one point. You haven't seen that kind of headache and agony ever. That kind of, this is like a splitting headache. That is, that is an acute phase. The, the catch is, sometimes these headaches get settled down. And then on CT scan, you can't pick it. Because CT scan in the 48 hours, the blood get washed out, especially in the younger population where the subarachnoid space is very, uh, very clean. 
they don't have arachnoid granulation occlusion. So after four days, CT scan won't pick. However, keep a very low threshold to get a CT angio done. If somebody is living away from, uh, you got a call or something, don't let it go. If that kind of headache history, they were even once. So get the CT scan done and get diagnosed that. Again, are on the side of bad investigation, wrong investigation, rather than not investigating. So any thunderclap headache, any the worst kind of headache, even you don't find anything on CT some, done somewhere else, you get a CT angiography done at least, and then take from there. The CT angio basically will show the very aneurysm, circle of Willis, the commonest yeah. site, and will tell you that there is something there. So as he said, sometimes you will get sentinel leaks, yeah. leaks before the actual major event. Sentinel leaks will come, the, the blood will be absorbed, again will be leak, will be absorbed till um, the major rupture occurs of the berry aneurysm. Uh, try not to miss the sentinel leaks if possible. Correct, yeah. What happens in the tertiary center when the patient comes? Yeah. So go, go to next slide. And one very important fact, subarachnoid hemorrhage patient will have photophobia and neck rigidity. When you examine the patient, there is a neck rigidity, CT scan even negative, chase it. And photophobia, the patient always tells you, just dim the light. I don't like the light. Yeah. Next. So this is the situation I'm talking about, you know. Um, 55 year lady on pilgrimage, there was no access to CT scan. And this CT scan done in Mumbai, normal. Nothing was there. Next. And seven days later, she had re hemorrhage. You can see, hemorrhage looks white. Here, there is no hemorrhage because it is done after five days, so all blood is gone. Next. Yeah. So this is uh, one of the situation. Also, you will get subarachnoid hemorrhage with tosses. This suggests that the berry aneurysm from where leak has happened, subarachnoid hemorrhage culprit, is also pressing the third now. Go ahead. And here you can see, whatever seen white on uh, CT scan also will be white on the flare sequence of MRI. So whatever white you see is the hemorrhage. Next. And this is the aneurysm looks on back. There is another aneurysm here also. So extra dural less than 3 millimeter aneurysm we don't treat. So the proximal aneurysm, proximal bulge we don't treat. The top one which is irregular, you can see the thumb down structure. From there leak must have happened. And the corpus is pressing the third nerve, that's why tosses. Next. So what we do in this situation, same, from the groin, we put a catheter and put platinum coils. Why platinum coils? Because platinum is a non-corrosive element. So it doesn't corrode and body makes a layer across the neck in again 6 to 10 weeks. So you see here, these are the coils and this is a balloon. Balloon to keep the coil inside the aneurysm, inside the abnormal structure not allowing to come to the normal blood vessel. Next. And this is how coil mass looks. So you see the same kind of aneurysm structure, if you remember. It was like a figure of eight structure in horizontal orientation. Next. And this is how they recover. Over two months, their pupillary dilatation, midriasis, and <coughs> tosis, tosis is gone. Pardon, ma'am? So, arachnoid hemorrhage, uh, does it cause seizures and how frequently? Yes, yes. The major hemorrhages. What is seizure? Seizure is because of the raised ICP. Seizure, yeah. yeah. Yes, madam. It happens. Okay, uh, I think all of us have on our group, we have the videos of coiling and I think clipping also. Uh, just go through them whenever you can revise. Uh, we have tried to give them some priming uh, before that. And I, I will think share this have, presentation also with you. That will be very nice, that will be very nice. Okay, uh, a quick uh, couple of questions. Subarachnoid hemorrhage you have treated. There were multiple berry aneurysms in the circle of Willis. The yeah. culprit berry aneurysm you coiled uh, and treated. What do you do with the rest? Correct. So before, um, before that, as we have discussed earlier, before this meeting preparation, 
like stroke, you know, you have seen six day discharge, seven day discharge, seven hundred hemorrhage net like that. It's just half battle, half story. This is half glory. Real battle start when the whatever hemorrhage has happened. You call it, you just seal the part of it, right? Hemorrhage, you stop the hemorrhage. But what about the effect of hemorrhage? Like Madam is saying, Caesar. So we keep patient till 14th day in the hospital. Why 14th day? Because subarachnoid space is like a sink. And hemorrhage is like you have thrown cement into it. So it obstructs the CSF flow. And till what time it gets washed out? Again, 10 to 14 days. So till that time, hydrocephalus may set in, especially in the elder population, where the subarachnoid space is not clean. The arachnoid villi are not that porous like us, like the younger population. So first thing, hydrocephalus. And second thing is vasospasm. All this blood which has gone inside will create some irritation in the subarachnoid space to the adventitia of the blood vessel and creates the vasospasm. What it does, it creates a stroke but transient one, they always recover. So for that purpose, we keep patient in the hospital. Coiling is just a part of it. And after that, it starts. Second thing, um, other about the other berry aneurysm, as we have seen, this, uh, the smaller extra dual aneurysm, we don't pay attention to, unless it is more than four to five mm. In a ruptured aneurysm individual, we treat all those unruptured aneurysms also. Same size aneurysm in a patient who is incidentally diagnosed a barrier aneurysm, we don't treat. But even a 3 mm aneurysm, if we see in an individual who had a ruptured history, we treat them. And their siblings, especially female population. We treat, uh, suppose a sister is having a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage history, we treat sister's unruptured aneurysm we uh, screen them at least once in life. Even if the sister is asymptomatic and has Still, a 3 millimeter plus, plus we treat them. aneurysm, you will coil them? I will treat them. Yeah, okay. Much, much higher uh, probability to treat them rather than an individual who has no family history, sibling history of subarachnoid hemorrhage, 3 mm. Still we treat them. Suppose I want to decide, okay, I want to check whether I have berry aneurysms. I get a CT angio or MR angio, is it better seen in CT angio or MR angio? CT angio. CT, I got a CT angio done. Yeah. I get banerism 4 mm size in my cell. Should I go for a prophylactic? No. Yeah, so uh, the criteria for treatment is location. Suppose somebody is having a 4 mm hypertensive on antiplated MC aneurysm, we treat them. Okay. If less than 3 mm, borderline, dural cave aneurysm, which is not in the subarachnoid space, we don't treat them. So how, how do these patients come to you? Why would they do a CT angio in the first place? So majority of these are diagnosed on MR angiography nowadays because okay. for a stroke we do regular MR angiography. And from there we take it over. Okay. That what, how to, because ultimate criteria we put on the DSA when we know the architecture of aneurysm, its irregularity, multilob is there or not, and what kind of risk we are dealing in the treatment. So last question here, uh, if any of them have a sibling with a ruptured bearing aneurysm in the past, should they get a CT angio done? Hundred percent. Okay. Yeah, in a in a family history of subarachnoid hemorrhage. If a first degree relative has a subarachnoid there there. hemorrhage, otherwise no need to screen. You should do your own CT angiography. Two CT scan in a span of five years. Suppose somebody is third, I'm talking relative only. Suppose um, uh, elder sister, like at 45, the peak of subarachnoid hemorrhage is 45 to 56, 60. So younger sibling is support 35 year old. Get CT angio th then and there, first, and after five years, one more. Yeah. In, in ruptured, we'll treat the two mm also. Rupt, yes. Yes. And 
stop madam because these are the icp related seizure these are not the focal seizure we get in temporal lobe uh, uh, sclerosis so usually they stop madam yes nothing to worry about madam yes that is a very good question he is asking if patients with adult uh, onset BKD, polycystic yes. uh, kidney yes. disease they have an association with barianism yes so what should be done so uh, as soon as you diagnose get a basic uh, uh, ct angiography done that that will pick it up correct uh, i think we'll end here because we our next speaker is also here uh, uh, i think it deserves a round of applause from all of us <laughs> thank you sir, so much and uh, this is our gift from all of us to dr nishant thank you thank you so much sir Uh, the, I think our second speaker, uh, luckily, is already here.